Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back to episode 6 about Europe's Ottoman Islamic Europe's Ottoman Islamic forgotten heritage now today episode 6 is talking about Istanbul of course Constantinople as promised Istanbul now the pearl of the Byzantine Empire the pearl of the Mediterranean Sea one of the most beautiful cities in the world, a magnificent capital, it used to be, and not anymore, but still, it still attracts many people. To go and see Istanbul is one of many people's dreams. Now, especially for a Muslim nowadays, we should never forget the Ottoman Empire, the last empire, the last caliphate, the last sultanate on this planet, and it finished in 1923. Now, this has was, what has remained is, is what we can, we can see now in front of us. Beautiful city, beautiful to see, and there's a lot to discover. Now, I had the chance, alhamdulillah, as I said in the f previous episodes, I had the chance to discover Istanbul, Bursa, Edirne, these three capitals of the Ottoman Empire, and I had even the chance to do some more research about the Ottoman Empire, alhamdulillah, which brought me to the point where I'm now saying basically that indeed the Ottoman Empire was a mighty empire, one of the biggest in the world, and something we should never forget, as Muslims especially. Now, just a quick reminder of last episode. In the last episode, we spoke a bit about the way that the Ottoman Empire was structured, the way that it started. We spoke about Osman, of course, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. We spoke about Orhan, his son. We spoke about Murat, Orhan's son, who we mentioned came from a Greek mother, right? So just to make a point again, I'm sure that I upset many people, but it doesn't matter. It's just a historical fact. Now, we went on talking about Murat himself, actually. Murat himself, Sultan Murat I, went into his father's footsteps and married another Greek lady. And they also had children, of course. Now, Murat, Sultan Murat I, was an amazing sultan, another amazing sultan, mashallah, who was given the name Sultan of Rum. This is something we did not mention last time. Sultan of Rum means the, the Sultan of the land of the Byzantine Greeks. That's how much they actually admired the Byzantine Empire. And they would have liked to be like the Byzantine emperors. Actually, they, they, they saw themselves, the Ottomans, just to make this clear, it was not an inferiority complex or something. It was simply that the Byzantines, the, the Ottomans, saw themselves as the, the next Byzantines. Okay, they inherited the Byzantine Empire. That's the way they looked at it. And they wanted to be recognized like this. But Europe, of course, did not look at it that way. Simply because, of course, because of the Ottomans being Muslims. They played an important role. Now, it's a little bit like if we want to see nowadays how it is with Turkey. Turkey would like to be part of the European Union, but the problem of the Europeans is one, the, 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 the one and only one, or the biggest one actually, not one and only, but the biggest one, of course, the cultural difference, the religious difference. Now, we should not forget, we're talking about millions of people who would join the European Union being Muslims. 98% of the country, if not even 99% of the country officially are Muslims. So, it will change the balance of culture and religion within the European Union. Now, that time, Pretty much the same, the Ottoman Empire entered Europe and the power, the power balance changed, of course. Now, <clears throat> Sultan Bayezid, 
who was the next uh, sultan. As we can see, we're still in the rise. We discussed the issue of rise, growth of the empire, Ottoman Empire. Now, it grows after 1453, of course, after the opening of Constantinople, which became Istanbul. So we are now after Murad Bayezid follows, who was given the name Yildirim, which means the thunderbolt. Now, he was the fourth sultan. His wife, the princess that he married, was a princess, the daughter of Prince Lazar of Serbia. So it was a Serbian princess. Now, in that case, Bayezid is an important sultan that we have to mention here because he was the one who was captured by Taimur. Taimur Lan, Mongolian, who captured him, came from Asia, captured him, managed to, to, to win over Bayezid. And that was actually a sudden break in the Ottoman Empire, in the Ottoman dynasty. Because what happens? What happens now? Where are the Ottomans now? So Sultan Bayezid basically is gone. The Ottoman Empire, suddenly there was a vacuum and the Taimur Lan was the one who took basically power over. Now, the period between 1402 and 1413 was known as the period of interregnum, which is the period where basically nobody of the Ottomans was really ruling because the Ottomans were, they lost the war against Taimur Lan. Now, Tamerlan was a Mongol, and it's said that there are some controversial sources, talk, controversial uh, points about him. It's said that he used the sultan as a footstool, on the one hand. Other sources say that he used, the, he used to treat him in a very kind and, and nice way. And others, again, say that the sultan killed himself with drinking uh, poison, actually. Now, uh, these are all controversial statements. We don't know really what, what the truth is. We, we don't know history. Uh, that, that happens very often in history. We, we were not very sure what exactly happened, but I'm just giving you some of the points that I mentioned in the history books. Now, the next important, very, very, very important Sultan after the Yazid, of course, is Sultan Mehmed Celebi. As we can see here, Sultan Mehmed Celebi 1413, he takes over, he takes over, wins over the rest of his brothers who are all fighting to gain the throne of the Ottomans. And everybody in Europe thought that time, that's it, the Ottomans are beaten down, that's it, there is no threat anymore. But no, Sultan Mehmed Celebi, Mehmed is the Turkish word for Muhammad, he takes over the throne 1413 until 1421. And he was given the name Celebi because he was considered now, from now on, he was the one who restored the empire. Now, he restored the Ottoman Empire, moved the capital from Bursa to Edirne now, now, although Murad did it actually before, but this is the official move now, the official move. And Mehmed is widely known as the second founder of the Ottoman Empire. And they, of course, in Turkey, you will be able to find his mausoleum, which um, is, of course, uh, as beautiful as all the others are. And they do remember him as one of the bigger sultans indeed, and as I said, the second founder. So basically, after Osman and Sultan Orhan, one of the most important ones, if not even the most important one. Now... And Sultan Mehmed was the one who had the first mosque built on European soil. He was the first one to have a Euro the, Euro the, 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 the first Ottoman European mosque built on European soil. The mosque of the Dimotichos. Now we will talk about this one, inshallah, go into details about this one, because we will talk about the north of Greece, where the Dimotichos is a little town nowadays, and this little town used to even be the capital of the Ottoman Empire for a very short period of time. And there is a masjid which is very different to the rest of the masjid, to the rest of the mosques that we can find in the Ottoman Empire. But again, as we said, we will talk about it, inshallah, later. Now, Murad Koja, the next sultan, Murad Koja, 1421 to 1451, his again, as we can see. Murad Koja was 
buried in the Muradiyya complex in Bursa. Again, now these sultans, all of them that we mentioned until now, are all buried in Bursa, not in Istanbul. Whereas the others following are all buried in Istanbul. Now, he captured a vast, vast area, vast territories in the Balkans, and succeeded in annexing Serbia in 1439. In 1441, the Holy Roman Empire, Poland, and Albania joined the Serbian-Hungarian coalition against the Ottomans, but could be defeated by Murad. So he defeated this coalition, which was a massive, massive coalition. Okay, we're talking about basically uh, a, a mighty Christian power, okay, a big Christian power, that, which came to finally destroy the Ottomans, as they had hoped that, would hap that had happened before, but seeing that it did not happen, they thought, let's just finish them off. They thought. But they thought wrong, and Sultan Murad Koja was the one who beat him, and that was the most important thing that he actually did during his reign. Now, he relinquished his throne in 1444. To his son Mehmed II, but a Janissari revolt in the empire forced him to return. He came back again. Sultan Murad's many successes were mainly the defeat of the Christian coalition, the one that we mentioned before, and the capture of vast territories in the Balkans. Now, he defeated his uncle, the so-called false Mustafa, the pretender. We used to have these things also. I mean, this happened too, as it happened actually also in Spain during the time of the Umayyads, that some people claimed to be the righteous caliphs. They claimed to be the righteous sultans. They claimed to be the ones better than the, the, the real sultan. So we used to have it, unfortunately, also during the time of the Ottomans. And that was one of these times when the uncle of Murad Koja was claiming to be actually the Mustafa, the Sultan, but the, he, he has gone into history as the pretender. Murad could stabilize the empire's frontiers by peace treaties. A very important point. Again, he managed, he managed to keep peace in the empire. He managed pretty much to keep peace. He didn't like war. It's known, he's known in history as somebody who was a peace-loving person and would retreat to, uh, to, to make dhikr and would retreat to, to make his, sal his prayers, his salah, and he would, um, he would be very religious, a very religious person. Now, as we've seen, up to the point of Sultan Murad Koja, we have these sultans, who played an important role during the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Okay? During the rise of the Ottoman Empire, starting with Osman, going over to Orhan, Murad, Bayezid, Sultan Mehmed Celebi, Sultan Murad Koja II, who finished the period of the rise. Now, after the break, we're going to talk about, indeed, one of the heroes of the Ottoman Empire, inshallah. And you will see whom I mean. Salaam alaikum. Chosen as part of the best of mankind, we spread the word of Islam. If I think I lost my ablution, but I'm not sure, do I have to make wudu again? Is it allowed for Muslims to visit the graveyard or is that shirk? Am I allowed to say Juma Mubarak to someone? Can I get to know a sister before marriage? I have so many questions and I feel that I've just reached a dead end. If only I could find someone trustworthy to answer my questions. Someone who speaks based on proof from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Chosen 
whisper of the best of mankind. We spread the word of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second part of this very, very important episode. Now, we started talking about Sultan Mehmed Fatih already, but obviously this is not enough. Even a whole episode is not enough to speak about Sultan Mehmed Fatih, who was one of the biggest Ottoman sultans ever. And you will understand why, I think, when we finish to look into what he did in Constantinople. Constantinople at that time, of course, changed the name, it has become Istanbul. One important thing that I would like to mention here is, is Istanbul, Istanbul, which I mentioned in the beginning, but just a reminder again, Istanbul is not Islambul, as many people might believe that. Many Muslims would love to believe that. I mean, mashallah, I'm a Muslim too, and I would love to believe that too, but it's not like this. Istanbul is just a Greek, it comes from a Greek phrase, Istinpolis, which means into the city. Now, Polis, that time, Istanbul, Constantinople, used to be the biggest city in the world. It was the biggest city in the world. And the Greeks, the Byzantines, referred to it as the city, Epolis, the city. So, whenever they would go to the city, they would say, Pau Istinpoli, Pau Istinpoli. It became Istinpol, Istanbul. So, that's where it comes from, and it does not come from Istanbul, as much as we would love to have it as, as Muslims, mashallah. But no, it's just simply a fact. Now, so Istanbul opened by Sultan Mehmet al-Fatih, the opener. Mehmet in Turkish, Muhammad, obviously. Now, 1453, 1453, and that, of course, changed drastically the whole cultural, political structure of the world, of the world. 1453, everything changed. The world was upside down. The Europeans did not know what to do. They did not know what to do. They had lost Constantinople. They had lost East Rome. Now, on the one hand, the Pope was not very unhappy because, as some of you might know, they had already broken the relationship, the church, the East Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Byzantine Empire, had already broken the ties with the West, with West Rome, which was nowadays Rome in Italy, with the Catholic Church, the Pope. So the Pope was already having this kind of attitude, um, well, leave them, they are anyway not real Christians, let's put it that way. So they did not really feel very sad about that on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, again, what's happening now, suddenly they have the Muslim Turks you know, in Europe, on European soil. And having conquered the biggest city in that part, in, 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 in that, that time, during that time, during that period. So it does, of course, raise a lot of eyebrows, and it did raise a lot of eyebrows, but this person, Sultan Mehmed, Sultan Mohammed II, who we can see here now, now, Sultan Mohammed II, 1444 to 1446, he did rule in between two years, but he was too young, and then he came back in 1451, and nobody expected him to be the one that Prophet Muhammad wasallam was talking about, that Istanbul or Constantinople is going to be opened. Now, he was the one in 1453. So, he was a well-educated and intelligent man. He spoke eight languages, of which one, Greek, was a very big language and very important one, simply because his mother was Greek. Again, again, we're looking into the Ottoman dynasty and we're looking into Ottoman blood. We see that there's a lot of Greek blood, right? So again, Sultan Mehmed Mohammed, Sultan Mohammed I, who opened Constantinople, actually had Greek roots. Now, he spoke Turkish, French, Latin, Greek, Serbian, Persian, Arabic, and Hebrew. A very well-educated person, religious person, and he had a strict Islamic education. Now, his sheikh, called Sheikh Akshams ad-Din, who had a great influence on the young sultan's life, he was the one who actually pushed him a lot towards going and doing what he did in the end, conquering Constantinople. There is a lot of, again, controver controversies about 
the Sheikh's life and the branch of Islam that he was following. As we know, as was mentioned before, the Ottoman Empire was built on Islamic Sufi or Sufi Islamic roots, and most of the Sheikh al-Islams, who were actually um, um, the advisors, the religious advisors of the sultans, most of them had Sufi tendencies. And uh, we can, I think, also say that also this Sheikh was one of them. Now, he believed firmly in this young man. He believed firmly that Mehmed, as the authentic Hadith mentions, would be the one to conquer Constantinople. And he pushed him, as I said, for it. Now, Sultan Mohammed, Sultan Mehmed, of course, went into history because of the conquest of Constantinople, no doubt about it. Now, after 57 day, after a 50 day, 57 day siege, he managed to do that, which was actually not too much, considering that nobody had ever done that before and could not manage to do that. Um, but we have to look into the, 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 the reality of, of, of that time, as I mentioned before, 1204, 250 years before, the Fourth Crusade had already invaded Constantinople and had actually already broken its power and its might and had already destroyed the very basic and very basic foundation of, of, of this empire. So it was not a difficult issue in the end to conquer something that was already very weak. It was a weakened empire anyway. However, that does not mean that it was not an important fact. It was a very important fact. But just to mention that, of course, it's, it's important to mention that again. Now, I do have some videos which I would like to play. Um, and I would like to, of course, just admire Istanbul, you know, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I would like you to participate and just take a look at this beautiful city. If you haven't traveled there, please do. And if you can just enjoy the, um, the, the, the videos that we're going to show you now, inshallah. Um, it is uh, one of the most amazing cities in the world. And it is really worth it to go and visit it. There is no doubt about it. It's really worth it to go and visit it. Now... Istanbul is nowadays not a capital anymore, not a capital anymore, but it still plays an important role. Now, this one, the video shows the Blue Mosque. The Blue Mosque is known throughout the world. Everybody knows the Blue Mosque. Everybody knows that this structure is one of the biggest structures and most important ones in the world. And you can clearly see on that day that we made the film, they were actually preparing an Ottoman documentary. And we were lucky to be there and uh, being actually present while they were filming it. Now, this video here shows another ankle, shows the minbar of the, of, the, um, of the Blue Mosque. You can take a look at the structure of the windows and of the dome which is beautiful. And indeed, the Ottoman architects did copy the Byzantine architecture and Byzantine structure, no doubt about it. They did do that. As the Greeks keep saying, they copied as they didn't do anything themselves, but this is not correct. Why they did that was, as is, again, it shows tolerance in Islam. When the Muslims conquered other cities and other countries, they actually did not just put a mosque in the middle of the place which did not fit into the surrounding, but in the contrary, they would actually put mosques and, and integrate them into the surrounding of these mosques, in, in, into the surrounding, into their areas and the environments. So, as we can see in Africa in many places, we can also see that here in Istanbul, Constantinople is a wonderful example for that, beautiful example for that, and the same in places like Mali, Mauritania, and so on, and so on. These places are actually clear places that indicate, that show how tolerant the Muslims actually were. And not that they were copycats. No, let's not take it that way, as the Greeks like taking it. 
No, they did not copy the others. And if they copied, then they took what is beautiful, took it over. There's nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. So there were the Ottomans did take some of the Byzantine architecture over and did build the mosques in accordance to Byzantine structure and a lot of the, the domes remind you of Byzantine churches, no doubt about it, but that's just again an indication for the tolerance of Islam, for the tolerance and the acceptance of other cultures and other, even other religions, other cultures and even other religions. Um, it's a wonderful example, I think, and Istanbul is really one of the best examples, even until nowadays, even until nowadays. And you have, if you have a chance to, to go and visit Istanbul once, you should definitely go and take a look at this magnificent city. Now, Sultan Mehmed established the Islamic millet system. What does it mean? What does it mean? The millet system is very Islamic. It means simply the people are divided according to their religion and not according to their nationality. They are divided according to their religion. So he gave the Christians their rights. He gave the Jews their rights. He gave the Muslims their rights. Okay? And these people all lived together as they did before under the Umayyads in Spain and in Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula. As they did in Sicily, they basically also did that in the Byzantine Empire, which now had become the Ottoman Empire. And especially the first years um, during the rule of the first sultans, and even after Sultan Muhammad, even after him, they, they are magnificent, magnificent, magnificent examples, great examples of how tolerant the Muslims and the Ottomans actually were. Jazakumullah khair, I would like to thank you very, very much. And I will hopefully, inshallah, be able to see you next episode and go deeper into this issue. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa We are the Muslim Ummah. And each day that goes by, the harder we try. In gratitude we pray to Allah Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Each man at each hour In all of his power Each flower, each tree Everything that we see Spread the word, oh man Spread the word of Islam Oh, fortunate one Paradise must be won